if cows had gods, what would those gods look like? It might seem like a silly question, but it's a serious question that the Greek pre-Socratic philosopher Xenophanes once asked. And he said, if horses or oxen or lions had hands or could draw with their hands and accomplish such works as men, well, horses would draw the figures of the gods as similar to horses and the oxen as similar to oxen. And they would make the bodies of the sort which each of them had. Of course, what Xenophanes is talking about is this universal tendency of humanity to project into the heavens what we are, to take our own twisted and warped images of ourselves and to pretend as if God is just like we are. What I sometimes call uh, the, the earthing of heaven, taking earth, taking humanity, and pretending as if heaven, God, is just the same way as we are. There's a great psalm verse, by the way, from Psalm 50, which succinctly describes this idolatry. God is speaking, and God says this, These things you have done, all these bad things he's been talking about, these things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was just like you. You thought that I was just like you basically sums up what idolatry is. Now, why am I talking about idolatry? Because... The gospel reading for this coming Sunday is from Matthew 25. It's the parable of the talents. And when you get to the third servant, the one who's going to end up being cast out, what is his fundamental problem? His fundamental problem is idolatry. What has happened is he has begun to think of his master as if his master is just like he is. He has pretended and believed that his master deals with people in the same way that he deals with people. And so this is an idolization. This is a transforming of his master into an idol. So it's what I might call the idolization of the idolizing of the master, but in in the worst possible sense. Because instead of believing in a master who's inherently good and generous, which this master is, he's transmogrified him into this ruthless taskmaster who manipulates his subject solely by fear. So we're going to get into the details of the parable now, but I wanted to get that up front so you know the direction I'm going with it. Idolatry is at the core of the problem of this third servant. And therefore, the opposite of that, faith and faithfulness and right worship is at the core of the first two servants, fidelity to their Lord. Okay, so how does it begin? Here's how it starts. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. What we have described here is basically the the whole era of New Testament salvation, we might say. So Christ comes, the master, he gives talents to his people, and then he goes away. So Christ ascends to the right hand of the Father, and he will come again one of these days. So, in just a couple of sentences, Jesus has summarized the entire era of New Testament salvation. Here is what, here's what happened, here's where we are, here's what's coming. Now, in this particular case, we have just an extravagant generosity on the part of the master. He's taken his money, these talents, and he's given them to his servants. He's given five to one, two to another, one to a third, each according to their ability. Now, when we hear talents today, we think of skills, aptitudes that we possess, right? So your skill is playing the piano, or your skill is working on cars, or your skill is uh, art, whatever it might be. You have your skill, you have your talent. America's got talent, right? We have a show, a show named that. But in the, in the New Testament, in the ancient world, talents did not mean that. In fact, our English word talent comes from the Greek, based upon its usage here and and elsewhere. So a talanton, which is the Greek word for talent, a talanton originally meant a balance, that is a scale. And then it came to mean anything that was weighed, and then later it came to mean a specific weight of about 30 kilograms, and that varied from time to time and place to place. Finally, it came to be used of money, indicating the value of that weight of gold or silver or copper. So a talent would be 6,000 denarii or 3,000 double drachmas. That's a lot of money. All these thousands of denarii, a denarius, as we've talked about in other videos, was what a person received for one day's kind of blue-collar wage. 
So one talent is a lot of money. Two talents is an extraordinary. Five talents is an unbelievable, unbelievable amount of money that this master is giving to his servants. It doesn't matter so much the exact uh, amount that would be translated into our currency. The point is that it's not just a few dollars. The point is that these are magnificent riches that the master has bequeathed to his servants. Well, what's going to happen with each of these servants? Let's read on. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. So we have the first two servants who are basically doing the same thing. They're working with the money. They're trading the money, and they're getting a return on that. In fact, double in both cases. The one with five gets five more. The one with two gets two more. And then we have the third who goes and buries his money. And then when it says that they, they traded with the money, the Greek there is actually they, they worked with the money. So ergazomai is the Greek that's used. He ergazomai with them. That is with the talents. In fact, so ergazomai is, is a verb and the noun is ergon. We get our word ergonomics from this, that study of the efficiency of people in the workplace. So ergon is work. Ergazomai is to work. Now, fascinatingly, if you look in Genesis 2.15 in the Septuagint, where it says the Lord God put the man, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, that verb for work is the same one that's used here. The reason I think that's important is because this has to do with, with what we do with what God has given to us. Well, in the Garden of Eden, God put Adam there with a vocation. He bequeathed all of this to him at the beginning and said, I want you to work it, to guard it, to keep it. This was Adam's stewardship of creation. It was God's gift to him. And then God, call, God called him to take care of the gift that had been given to him. And we'll see another echo of Genesis 2 and 3 in just a minute. But just as Adam was to work, so these first two servants, they worked, they they took that which God had given to them, and they were faithful in their use of it. Now, what's going to happen when the master returns? Let's go on. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents, and here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done! Good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So far, so good. It sounds great, doesn't it? And this is exactly the way that Jesus wants us to think about his second coming. It's a time of joy and rejoicing over the gifts that God has given to us. We often think about the second coming of Christ with, with fear, with, with trepidation, trepidation, thinking, oh, it's just going to be a terrible day. No, it's not. It's going to be a fantastic day. When Christ comes again to receive us as his people, it's going to be a time of, of rejoicing, of partying. Every image that we have in the New Testament of Christ's return, for believers, it is something that we just can't wait to happen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come now. Come and receive your people to yourself. Say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on, come into the joy of your master. In fact, this is the third in a series of parables where we have this kind of language used. If you go back to chapter 24, the faithful servant, the master says to him, blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. He will set him over all his possessions. That's chapter 24. Last Sunday, we had the parable of the 10 virgins. While the five foolish were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, the five wise, went in with him to the marriage feast. It's a marriage feast. It's a time for rejoicing. 
And then in this one, we have the master saying, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So joy, not gloominess. Happiness, not fear, is what ought to be our focus when we think about the second coming of Christ. But of course, there's more to the story. There is a third servant. So let's see what happens to him. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. And then God responds to him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have scattered no seed. Well, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was, what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, let me remind you what I said at the beginning of this video about the two most important lines in this parable. And when I say most important, I mean most important as far as giving us the interpretive key to understand exactly what's going on with this particular servant. And those two lines are this. Master, I knew you to be a hard man. And then secondly, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. That second, that second sentence is our second echo, I think, of Genesis 2 and 3. The first was that Adam was to work the garden. But remember what happened when he, in, when he himself engaged in idolatry? When he thought that he knew more than God? When he elevated himself? above God, when he was reaching to elevate himself to this kind of level of divinity? Well, when God actually appeared, when God came to him as this master comes to the servant, what happens? Adam was afraid, and he hid himself. In fact, in the Greek, the word for afraid, both in Matthew 25 and Genesis 3, and the word for hid, both in Matthew 25 and Genesis 3, are exactly the same. So this particular servant is engaging in an, in, in an Adam kind of behavior. He's afraid. And so he's not hiding himself, but he hid the money. So we have kind of a fall narrative that is underneath the surface here. So this is how, this is what he thinks of God. That he thinks that he needs to, this is what he thinks of master. He needs to be afraid of him and he needs to hide that which has been given to him. And there's another element here as well. He calls him a hard man. Now, this is an insult. There's no other way around this. In Greek, it's a skleros man, which can mean like not only hard, but harsh, difficult, stubborn. We get our word sclerosis from this, which is like a hardening of the body, like an artery from disease or excessive growth of tissue. So in, in, in the Old Testament uh, Greek translation, skleros is used to describe hardness of heart. So when he calls him a hard man, he's saying, you're harsh. Oh, I, I know what kind of guy you are. You're just, you're tough to deal with. And so because of that, I was, I was afraid. And so I just, I didn't do anything. I just dug a hole and I put your, put your talent in the ground, which by the way, was a, was a pretty common way of dealing with, with wealth back then. You, you hide it, you dig a hole and you bury it. That's what he thought he needed to do because, because he thought that's the kind of man he was dealing with. But he wasn't. The man he was dealing with was generous, was kind, was gracious, had given to both this third servant as well as the first two servants that which they did not deserve. It was all gift. They were already under their master. Everything was already good between them. He, out of his generosity, gave this wealth to them to steward, to take care of. And two of them, the first two, knowing him to be a good, faithful, generous master, behaved accordingly. In other words, to translate this into theological language, they knew the true God. They worshiped the true God. And so their lives reflected that. 
and their stewardship of that which God had given to them. But the third guy, because he worshipped a false god, also lived a false life. Because he worshipped an idol, he had a false idea of what stewardship really was. He thought that he had a difficult, harsh, mean, hard master. And because of that, he behaved accordingly. He was worshiping a false god. Luther is very helpful here. In his large catechism, his explanation of the first commandment, he explains with great precision what exactly it means to have a god and how that is linked with faith. Now think of how Luther's words apply to this situation. Luther says this, A god is the term for that to which we are to look for all good, and in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore, to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. As I've often said, it's the trust and faith of the heart alone that make both God and an idol. If your faith and trust are right, and then your God is the true God. Conversely, where your faith and trust, where your trust is false and wrong, there you do not have the true God. For these two belong together, faith and God. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. Well, in this particular case, this third servant, the one who was unfaithful, he had a false God. He had a false master. He had transmogrified that master into someone that he was not, and so he reacted accordingly. And not only that, this is kind of some dark humor here, but he couldn't even be faithful in his infidelity. (laughs) He couldn't even be faithful in his idolatry. He even screwed that up. Because when it, when it came right down to it, the master says, you have acted like a slothful man. You're a wicked and a slothful servant, he says to him. So he's even a failure at worshiping the idol that he's created in his own mind. If he'd truly been afraid, well, then he would have done something, anything, instead of burying the talent. I mean, he would just take it and put it in the Put a savings account in the bank and let it at least gain a a meager amount of interest, right? But he didn't even do that. And so his inaction reveals that he's not only a wicked but a slothful servant. That is where his idolatry has led him, both to wrong faith and wrong love, a lack of faith and a lack of loving service. Let me wrap all this up with what I think are three of the many points that this parable puts before us. One of these is the prodigality of divine love. God is not stingy. God is not tight-fisted. He gives out of the abundance of what he has to us. He's prodigal with his love and his mercy toward us, as he was with these three servants. And the seriousness of judgment. There will be a judgment. These three servants were judged. But as we saw, the first two saw this judgment as a time of rejoicing a time of joy in which they were received by their master into his joyous company. And then thirdly, laughing at the eschaton. Now, when we think of eschaton, when we think of the end times, we usually don't associate that with laughing, but it is. It's a time when we enter into the wedding feast. We enter into the joy of the master. We hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. Come to my party. I have claimed you as my own, and I am well pleased with you. So that's the parable. We are the ones with whom Christ is well pleased because he is the one who's made us his own. To worship the true God, our Father in our Lord Jesus Christ, is to worship the one who is truth itself. And when we're in Christ, everything is okay. Because we are received into that one who is the beloved of the Father, and so we ourselves are beloved as well. Thanks for watching. If this has been helpful, please share it with others. And I pray that you will uh, have a a blessed Lord's Day as you hear this text read and, and preached on. May God's peace be yours in abundance. Thank you.